Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business today is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I prefer short and succinct questions and indeed answers to match. Question one, Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to local authorities to help reduce carbon emissions emissions and contribute towards the 2013-27 emissions reduction targets. Mr Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, aside from engagement through the Public Sector Climate Leaders Forum, Scottish Government provides a range of assistance to support local authorities uh, to meet their obligations under the public uh, body's duties in the Climate Change Act. Uh, for example, through providing £440,000 through uh, funding support to the Sustainable Scotland Network, through the work of Resource Efficient Scotland, which will receive £7.3 million in 2014-15, through access to finance and expertise via the Scottish Futures Trust and other mechanisms, including the £20 million Central Energy Efficiency Fund, and in 2013-14, we invested £2 million directly in local authority LED lighting projects. Through the investment of more than £10 million to local authorities and partners to support EV infrastructure and vehicles, with a further uh, £5 million invested, investment planned this year, and through providing £20 million since 2011-12 to councils to support food waste collections. I uh, can also give further details about bus investment fund, uh, smarter choices, smarter places, energy efficient, home energy efficiency programmes for, for the moment. Scotland, but bearing in mind, yep. the officer's point. point. <laughs> I thank the Minister for that comprehensive response. Um, a key part of the Glasgow 2014 bid to host the Commonwealth Games was the designation of several low emission zones around each of the sporting venues. How does the Scottish Government intend to work with the Glasgow City Council to ensure that air quality in these areas continues to meet national air quality standards after the conclusion of the Games? Uh, well, clearly, I mean, this is about the supplementaries about air quality, but it does have relevance to climate change as well, so I, I accept the point. Um, low emission zones uh, are something that uh, we're interested in learning evaluation evidence from Glasgow, so we're working with the Council to see what evidence, over limited periods of time, clearly, during the Commonwealth Games, we can learn about the impact of that, that measure in Glasgow. Uh, but I would just say that we're also supporting Glasgow City Council to providing uh, almost £600,000 worth of support uh, in terms of electric vehicle funding, which will help reinforce that kind of approach. In, in Glasgow over the period 2010 up to 2013-14 and we've also given uh, grants of almost uh, £920,000 to First Glasgow for 10 buses under the Green, uh, Scottish Green Bus Fund. So there are a number of measures we're taking in supporting the action of local authorities like Glasgow to trial uh, measures like this and hopefully the supporting infrastructure investment will make it more likely that will succeed in the future. Many thanks. Question two, John Pentland. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made with the monitoring and re regulation of tyre recycling and disposal. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. As John Pentland will know from our discussions around the earth mover tyres issue when significant problems arose, we sought to strengthen SEPA's powers in the passage of the Regulatory Reform Act Scotland to ensure that SEPA officers have the regulatory tools to tackle non-compliance and criminality in the waste sector. SEPA has taken enforcement action at a number of sites and will continue to take action to bring priority sites back into compliance. As part of a comprehensive plan, SEPA will also be working with waste tyre producers such as tyre fitters across Scotland uh, to ensure that they take a high level of interest in how their waste is dealt with and to prevent them uh, dealing with non-compliant storage or treatment sites. Thank you. John Pentland. Can I thank the Minister for that response? As the Minister is probably aware, there is a huge tyre dump on the flight path to Glasgow Airport. You know, like the one near Wisher General Hospital, it has 100,000 tyres, is unlicensed and a fire there could have a catastrophic impact. Given that, despite the responsible recycler scheme, there is still a lot of illegal disposal with almost all major enforcement actions involving exempt operations. Has the Minister considered a moratorium on waste, on waste exemptions for the end of life tyres? Minister. Uh, well, we, we haven't uh, taken that approach to date uh, that Mr Pentland sets out, but we are, in the case of the, the site he mentions, taking uh, regulatory action. I would just point out that, as of today, I believe Fergus Ewing has signed um, uh, orders that allow the Regulatory Reform Act to come into force. So we, we now have a, an act which we can use um, in, in implementing tighter enforcement. But I'm happy to, to take any representations from Mr Pentland on the particular point he makes, but we don't have any plans at this stage to impose a moratorium. Thank you. Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you. What support is available for helping companies promote the fact they use products made from recycled tyres? Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Well, um, 
In terms of the, the member will know that the uh, Cabinet Secretary is very keen to develop a circular economy approach and uh, looking at all how we can use all sorts of raw materials to try and make sure they are retained and reused within Scotland rather than lose the value of what are uh, important raw materials. Uh, so we are working through the likes of um, Zero Waste Scotland and uh, Resource Efficient Scotland to try and promote these kind of ideas and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would be uh, keen to engage on a particular issue. Uh, where SEPA come in of course is in terms of regulatory uh, compliance issues and making sure that uh, sites are, are compliant with the law, uh, but clearly the uh, Cabinet Secretary would have an interest in the circular economy. I'm sure be interested in any representations you can make. Many thanks. Question three, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the Sustainable Action Fund is progressing. Minister. Um, the Sustainable Action Fund funds a range of activity to support local sustainability action and reduce carbon emissions. The largest component of the fund is the Demand-Led Climate Challenge Fund. The CCF supports communities to take practical action to reduce carbon and in the period since 2008 it has supported 658 awards to 486 communities with total awards of £57.2 million. The annual CCF allocation is £10.3 million uh, within the Sustainable Action Fund budget of £15.3 million. Following the refresh of CCF, uh, take-up has increased significantly and spend in 2013-14 was £9.8 million of the £10.3 million uh, allocated. In your demand has been such that I recently announced a CCF top-up of £1.5 million in 2014-15, taking the total funding available in the current year to £11.8 million and confirmed CCF funding at £10.3 million for 2015-16. Uh, Good progress has also been made on other areas of Sustainable Action Fund spend. For example, in 2013-14, uh, the remaining £5 million in the Sustainable Action Fund supported a range of activity, including the rollout of ISM tool, uh, providing £2 million to support transition to low-carbon street lighting and support for Greener Scotland's marketing campaign. Thank you. Gavin Brown. Thank for that answer. Um, in 2013-14, the original budget, I understand, was £15.3 million. It was reduced at the autumn budget revision to 13.3. It was reduced again at the spring budget revision to 11.7. Uh, million pounds. What was the final outturn figure for 1314? Minister. I, I don't have that figure to hand, uh, Mr. Brown, but I will happily write to, to the member with that information uh, as soon as I can get hold of it. Many thanks. Uh, question four, Stuart McMillan. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with West of Scotland local authorities on environmental improvement initiatives. Minister. <coughs> Um, the Scottish Government uh, regularly engages with local authorities about a range of environmental issues, including uh, flood protection, biodiversity, climate mitigation, air quality, uh, environmental protection and drinking water quality, among other subjects. And there are a range of environmental improvement initiatives underway in the west of Scotland. I thank the Minister for that uh, reply. The Minister is fully aware of my continued campaign for better flood protection measures throughout the west of Scotland particularly in the Inverclyde area, and recently uh, met with the Minister to highlight the case of Inverclyde and flood funding. Therefore, I would be grateful if the Minister can update me on the situation regarding flood funding for Inverclyde. Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government and COSL officials met represent, uh, representatives of Inverclyde Council recently to provide feedback on their unsuccessful application uh, for funding for flood protection work. The Council will now be invited to clarify uh, the rationale for how the Greenock part of the scheme, if taken alone, uh, would meet the published criteria for funding when the scheme as a whole uh, did not in the round in January. If the joint uh, Scottish Government COSLA assessment panel agree that the Greenock scheme is eligible, then the scheme will be funded. Thank you very much. Um, Stuart McMillan, you, you had your supplementary. Yes, forgive me. Uh, question five, Mark MacDonald. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it promotes the recreational opportunities of the forest estate. Sir. Uh, the Scottish Government and Forestry Commission Scotland fully recognise the growing evidence that Scotland woodlands play an important role in tackling health inequalities. Uh, Forestry Commission Scotland actively promotes responsible access by a wide range of users to the largest network of informal and formal recreation opportunities in Scotland, which last year hosted around 9 million visits. It achieves this through annual investments in its facilities, which in 2014-15 will be £11.8 million. This expenditure is supported in its recently uh, renewed recreation website, targeted advertising, media releases and on-site interpretation, including its six visitor centres. Uh, the Commission works in close partnership with public business and voluntary organisations at a national scale, such as mountain biking groups, and at a more local scale, such as Castle Miltwood near Glasgow, so that more people from a wide range of backgrounds can enjoy their local woodlands. And this is complemented by work that Visit Scotland, the Scottish Tourism Alliance and Scottish Sports Association undertake. 
Mark MacDonald. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank the Minister for his response. The Minister may be aware of the sculpture trail at Tyrebagger Wood in my constituency. Uh, the trail has been in place now for 15 years, but it's beginning to look a little bit tired and past its best. I wonder if the Minister might be willing to meet with me to discuss how this uh, trail could perhaps uh, have its recreational value enhanced to ensure that it can sit alongside some of the other pursuits, such as mountain biking and walking, that he has identified uh, and attract more people to use uh, the fantastic forest estate in the northeast of Scotland. Minister. Uh, cer certainly, I, I take the point that Mark Macdonald makes, and uh, Kirkhill and Tyrebagger forests are, are popular forests. I understand they have 1.8 million visits per annum um, uh, to uh, the uh, in Murray and Aberdeenshire area. So it's, it's obviously an area where uh, of Scotland where forest estate is very valued. Uh, I would be happy to arrange a meeting with the member to discuss the promotion and management of recreation uh, on the national forest estate. I would just point out in relation to Tyrebagger, in common with many art projects, uh, the sculptures were commissioned and managed by a charitable trust, and the trust has an agreement with Forest Commission Scotland and Aberdeen City Council dating back to the 1990s. However, in recent years, the Trust has struggled to maintain interest from its trustees uh, and to raise the necessary finance to sustain a commissioning of high-quality work placed at Tyrebagger. So I know there are issues about investment in the, in the forest there, but I'm glad to, to say that I'll be able to meet uh, Mr Macdonald to discuss that further. Claire Baker. The Minister and I were both at the CONFOR conference last week hearing about the challenges facing the forestry sector. Um, is he confident of meeting the 2022 target and how does he respond to calls from the industry to look at extending the target? Minister. Well, we have obviously gone through a process of the Woodland Expansion Advisory Group to look at uh, how feasible it is to deliver a target, not, not only in terms of woodland planting, but taking into account the impact on uh, agricultural use. And I think we have a route map, if you like, of how we can do that, working with stakeholders to ensure that forestry investment can take place. Uh, we have put in place funding of £80 million for this year and next year in total to ensure that we can uh, achieve our, our targets. Uh, we know there are at least 18,000 hectares that are in the pipeline for planting in the, over that two-year period. So we are confident in the short term that we can achieve it, but clearly we have to look at spending decisions in the future and, and obviously reflect circumstances at the time to ensure we keep uh, the, the uh, planting rates competitive so that we are able to uh, attract investment from the private sector and other partners as well. So um, I certainly keep Parliament informed of progress on this issue. Thank you. Question six, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government when it plans to launch its national litter strategy. And it's Secretary Richard Lockhead. I said at the turn of the year that my intention was to publish the strategy in early summer and therefore I will publish it very, very shortly. This will build on the high profile action we have already taken, such as increasing fixed penalties for litter and fly tipping and our recently passed regulations, of course, for a charge for single use carrier bags. And we have also provided half a million pounds over two years to keep Scotland Beautiful's Clean Up Scotland initiative. Yep. Neil Bibby. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can I ask that, given the consultation ended uh, last autumn and that in 2012 a commitment was given by the Minister to have it fully implemented ahead of the Commonwealth Games, why it has taken so long to launch its nat national litter strategy? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> well, as I explained, we are sticking to the timetable we laid out back when the consultation closed in terms of publishing the final strategy. I would point out to Parliament, of course, this is Scotland's first ever first ever national litter strategy and therefore let us make our, uh, every effort to get it right and I hope this will help influence behaviour in Scotland because ultimately no matter what the Scottish Government puts into a strategy it will depend on the cooperation of the people of Scotland to, to keep Scotland clean and tidy. Thank you. Question 7, Rob Gibson. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how the Agricultural Holdings Legislation Review Group can take account of the final report of the Land Reform Review Group, uh, the Land of Scotland and the Common Good, in addressing calls for the right to buy for 1991 farm tenants. Cabinet Secretary. Well, as Chair, I met with the other members of the Agricultural Holdings Legislation Review Group just last week to finalise the group's interim report, and that will detail the group's extensive evidence gathering and engagement to date. It explains where we have identified issues that do need to be resolved and how we intend to develop potential solutions. And as part of this work, the group note, of course, the Land Reform Review Group's consideration of many of the issues surrounding agricultural tenancies and small holdings and that group's recommendations in this area. So we will consider what they have said, as well as our own work as we develop our own recommendations in due course and support our own vision for a vibrant tenancy sector in Scotland. Rob Gibson. Thank you uh, for that answer. I wonder if I can press the Minister a bit further, you know, so as not to exacerbate tenant and landlord relations. Um, the 
Has the Agricultural uh, Holdings Review Group decided if there is a need for tenant farmers to register an interest to buy their tenancies? Indeed, if there is a preemptive right under the 2003 Act, surely we can abolish this need to register as an unwarranted uh, ex exacerbation of relations. <coughs> it's a good point that Rob Gibson raises, and of course, as I just explained, final decisions will not be taken to until the second half of the year after the interim report has been published and we move towards the final report uh, on that issue and other issues. However, we will consider it, and I give that uh, pledge today. And of course, as I said before, the Land Reform Review Group report just published a few days ago recommends, and I quote, the Scottish Government remove the requirement to register a right of preemption of Secure 1991 Act tenancies uh, as an unnecessary constraint and that 1991 Act tenants should have a first option in buying any part of the holding the landlord decides to sell. So I, I pledge we will consider this issue and we will certainly take into account uh, that recommendation from the Land Reform Review Group. Alex Ferguson. Um, thank you. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary might agree with me that the Land Reform Review Group has actually gone beyond its useful remit in making recommendations on agricultural holdings, as well as, I believe, on deer management and wild fisheries. Given the Scottish Government's own initiatives in establishing expert review groups to look into those areas and report back after hearing all the available evidence, something that the Land Reform Review Group has conspicuously failed to do. Well, the Land Reform Review Group received a warm welcome throughout Scotland uh, and from most of the parties uh, in this chamber. And it's a radical report. It's a very comprehensive report. There are 62 recommendations as well as some fantastic commentary on the wider issues facing land reform in Scotland. It is, of course, extremely difficult to divorce the issues of land reform from agricultural tenancies. So whilst the expert group on agricultural tenancies should provide the expert advice on that subject, it's only right and understandable that the Land Reform Review Group should also take into account wider agricultural issues and how they relate to land reform and land tenure in Scotland. So I don't think there's any, uh, there's any contradiction there, and it's perfectly right and understandable. Thank you very much. Question 8, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To, to ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to tackle fly tipping. Already this year we have quadrupled the fixed penalty level for fly tipping to £200 and we have taken powers in the Regulated Reform Scotland Act 2014 to allow SEPA to impose penalties of up to £40,000. And of course, as stated in my response to Neil Bibby earlier on, the National Litter Strategy will be published shortly and that will include action on fly tipping and build upon existing support through Zero Waste Scotland to clean up and prevent what is an unacceptable blight on our communities. George Adam. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. There has been a recent spate of fly tipping in many parts of my constituency. Now, this might be down to the local authority actually closing amenity sites, but can the Cabinet Secretary join me in calling for the current Renfrewshire Council administration to increase warden patrols, which have been dramatically cut since the beginning of their administration? Well, I certainly uh, condemn any fly tipping that's taking place in the member's constituency. And whilst I'm not clearly as familiar with local circumstances as he is in terms of recent cuts of warden services, I would, of course, urge all local authorities, including George Adams' local authority, to do all they can to tackle fly tipping and maintain a presence through the, the presence of wardens, if that's the chosen service locally, to deter uh, such uh, an abhorrent act uh, in our local communities. And, and these people that do that should really be ashamed of themselves, but we are taking action against them, uh, and we will make sure uh, that message is communicated to anyone out there in Scotland who is thinking of fly tipping in Scotland's beautiful countryside or in our communities. Okay. Question 9, Gil Patterson. Presiding officer, uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to open up new export opportunities for Scotland's food and drinks firms. Cabinet Secretary. I was delighted to launch Scotland's new food and drink export plan in March this year at Nairn's Oatcakes, and the plan will focus on deploying a team of global experts across key export markets to open up new opportunities and, of course, continue to drive international sales. The plan is a really good example of collaboration between the industry and the government. I am fully confident it will reap huge rewards for Scotland in the coming years and help the industry meet its new ambitious export target of £7.1 billion by 2017. Gil <coughs> Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, reply? This is going to be a strange question for somebody that never drinks, never have. 
but uh, a firm believer in what you fancy, a little bit of what you fancy does you good. <laughs> I have a number of constituents who are employed in the whisky industry, in particular in the Auchentosh distillery. So any increase in whisky exports is good news for Clydebank and Mulgai, my constituency. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide me with what projections have been made regarding overseas exports of whisky over the next five years, particularly in the emerging high-priority markets of China and South East Asia? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> well, although we may not uh, share the regularity by which we partake of a dram, uh, we certainly share the interest in the whisky industry because we both have uh, constituents employed in the Scotch whisky sector. Uh, so we both take a very close uh, interest in the, future, the fortunes of the sector, as many others do in this chamber. Um, whilst the Scottish Government does not hold such projections ourselves, the Scotch Whisky Industry Review for 2013 reported that over the five years from 2012 to 2017, it was estimated that the growth rate would be 3% per annum in terms of whisky export projections. So that's the industry's own um, projections. Uh, it's worth saying to the Chamber, the Scotch Whisky Association recently reported that there are aware, they are aware of around 30, 30 new distilleries being planned in Scotland at the current time, which is a phenomenal growth uh, of an iconic sector here in Scotland. And of course, that no doubt it's a sign of confidence that these projections for increased exports around the world, I understand there's 40 bottles of whisky exported per second from Scotland, it is going to continue for many years to come. Thank you very much. And we now move to questions to the Justice and Law Officers. And question one is from Lewis MacDonald. Mr MacDonald, when you're ready, please. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government how many police officers in Grampian have resigned since the creation of Police Scotland. Secretary uh, Kenny McCaskill, when you're ready. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The information requested is not held centrally. It is a matter for Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority. Uh, this government, though, is continuing to deliver on our commitment to 1,000 additional officers in Scotland with recorded crime at an almost 40-year low. Ms. Well, I'm disappointed that the Cabinet Secretary cannot answer such a simple question, of which he has had several days' notice and an opportunity to consult with the Chief Constable if required to do that. Does he recognise that the failure of either his Government or the Chief Constable to publish comparable police officer numbers for Grampian before and after the creation of Police Scotland simply fuels the sense of crisis in the policing of the North East and the concern that is there about the loss of local knowledge? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I hardly think that crisis would be the uh, description put upon Police Scotland in the North East. Uh, as the member will be aware, as the Chief Constable has made clear, Police Scotland is committed to publishing sub-national data quarterly. In the latest published figures, taking Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire and Murray divisions together, local resources increased by one. Regional resources available to the area increased by 12, and national resources available to them increased by 5. I accept that that is a marginal increase, but it certainly shows that the delivery of 1,000 additional officers nationally has been maintained, and the figure is also relevant there in the North East. The Chief Constable, the Scottish Police Authority and indeed myself am aware that there are challenges in particular due to the buoyant economy in the North East. It affects the police services, it affects public services and indeed uh, some aspects of the private sector given house prices and given available jobs. But what is clear is that the police service is being maintained in the North East and indeed it was a privilege to recently attend at Tully Allen where new recruits including many going to serve in the North East were passing out. Thank you. Question two has not been lodged in the name of Chick Brodie. An explanation has been provided. Question three, Roderick Campbell. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it plans to hold with the UK Government about the UK's block opt-out of the pre-Lisbon criminal law and policing measures. Minister Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, I have in fact spoken uh, uh, about this issue uh, to uh, the Home Office Minister responsible Karen Bradley MP uh, by telephone on 19th May. Um, the member will know, of course, that we are not a party to the negotiation process for the UK to opt back in to the 35 measures which they've indicated they wish to opt back into. But I expressed uh, the Scottish Government's concern about UK Minister's decision to opt out of these important justice and police cooperation measures and about any potential delay in the opt back in process. My officials are, of course, available to update the Justice Committee if they would find this helpful. Roderick Campbell. 
Mr. for that answer. I'm obviously concerned as a member of the Justice Committee that Karen Bradley uh, postponed a, a private meeting with the Justice Committee at very short notice last month. Uh, I'm grateful to the Minister for her other comments, but I would be grateful for assurance that she will continue to express concerns to the UK Government and to Karen Bradley, uh, particularly in relation to the European arrest warrant. Minister? Well, as I indicated in my initial answer, we have already had a, a, a conversation uh, uh, both herself and uh, uh, myself. And we do continue to remind the UK government that an operational gap between opting out and back into these measures would have a direct impact on our criminal justice system. Uh, my officials were in fact most recently in touch with Home Office officials just yesterday uh, and they uh, commented that negotiations were progressing well and that member states agree on the need to avoid an operational gap which could affect live judicial processes such as the European arrest warrant. Uh, we will continue to seek regular assurances from the UK government until a seamless transition has been ensured. Many thanks. Question four in the name of Margaret McDougall has not been lodged and a satisfactory explanation has been provided. Question five, Jackson Carlock. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that the licensing of air weapons is a proportionate measure, given that offences involving such weapons have fallen by 75% since 2006-07. Uh, yes, uh, while gun crime is at a 32-year low and continues to fall, thanks to the hard work of our police and courts, there is no reason to be complacent. Air weapon offences are not falling as quickly as those involving more powerful types of firearm. There were 171 offences involving an air weapon in 2012-2013. That's almost half, 47% of all firearms offences that year, and doesn't take into account the number of many incidents that go unreported. Justin Carlow. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? Can I inform of a conversation I've had with various constituents, admittedly air rifle enthusiasts, who are concerned that an unintended consequence of a licensing regime may be that some apply for a full firearms licence as an alternative. Now, the Cabinet Secretary may dismiss that concern. Indeed, he may be right to do so. But I wonder if he could confirm what assessment has been made of that probability. Cabinet Secretary. I'm happy to engage with the member, and indeed we do so through uh, regular meetings and engagement. The legislation has been formed, not only in conjunction with the police, but in conjunction and discussions with, the, uh, with Basque and indeed with those who represent those involved in uh, the responsible gun clubs. Uh, so if there are concerns, we're happy to engage. The last thing that we want to see is somebody obtain a certificate, um, likelihood at a higher cost than one that is necessary. So I think that's a matter where I'm happy to engage with the member if he's so wishes. Equally, I think that when it comes to the licensing regime, either through the responsible gun clubs, through Basque, who are vociferous uh, in this, and rightly so for their members, or indeed direct communications between the firearms officers and the individuals, I think we can ensure that the appropriate license is obtained for the appropriate individual and that that balances the appropriate need for a certificate, but the safety and security of our communities. Many thanks. Question six, Drew Smith. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met with the Chief Constable. Mr. Secretary. I regularly meet the Chief Constable to discuss matters of keeping people in Scotland safe. I last met him on 28 May at the public launch of the National Code of Ethics for Policing in Scotland at the Scottish Police College, and I was delighted to support this important development uh, which sees Police Scotland's values of integrity, fairness and respect firmly placed at the heart of the nation's policing. Drew Smith. I thank the Cabinet Secretary very much for that response. At his uh, next meeting with Sir, with Sir Stephen, will the Cabinet Secretary undertake to convey the real concerns which have been expressed by members from across this Parliament about the routine arming of police officers who are on patrol? And will he now accept that regardless of how long that practice has been going on in different parts of the country, it must now be nationally reviewed? Well, these aspects are for the Scottish Police Authority to review, and they may ch ch choose to do so. Uh, what I can do is repeat this, what has been said in previous chambers. The current regime that operates is the regime that operated in Strathclyde, uh, where Mr uh, Smith represents, operated in Tayside, and indeed was operated and had been instigated in Northern. It's now uh, gone national. Uh, the police service in Scotland, 98.6% uh, of officers, I believe, are not armed or authorised to be armed. It's something in the region, it's either 1.4 or 1.6 per cent are. That's, I think, approximately 275. Of them, some are on leave, some are abstracted, and they operate in a significant shift system. So the number of routinely armed officers in Scotland 
is but a fraction of that. But we do have to ensure that balance, because we have seen incidents in Scotland where tragedies have occurred. We've seen incidents south of the border. We've seen incidents in Norway. And I think we come to the conclusion that we have to have a limited number of officers ready, able and willing to secure our communities. We hope that never arises, but if it does, it's reasonable and proportionate. But I will pass the members' views on to the Scottish Police Authority. Many thanks. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does Cabinet Secretary agree that school campus police have an important role to play in developing good relations with young people? And does he consider that police who retire early have a wealth of experience which could be used to good effect if they were encouraged to continue a school campus police? And could he confirm if the numbers of school campus police have increased or declined since Police Scotland came into existence? And will he raise this issue with the Chief Constable when he next meets him? Four questions there, Cabinet Secretary. Well, thank you. I, mean, I think I'd first of all put on record that I, I very much welcome uh, campus officers. I don't have that precise information to hand, but I'll ensure that we, uh, probably through police, because I don't know how it's formally recorded, but we'll get that information as best we can out to the member. I certainly do appreciate the value of campus officers. Ironically, I was at an event in my own constituency with a charity skill force. I was speaking to the head teacher of a, a school in the city of Edinburgh who was praising the campus officer who I knew and, and indeed as the member mentions was actually going to be returning in a voluntary capacity to work with the school. Uh, obviously there's a distinct role between whatever voluntary capacity that individual may have and what they may be offering. But I think what I do take out of uh, uh, Margaret Mitchell is I think two points. First of all they do an outstanding job and I accept that. Uh, there's obviously other work that can and should be done and they have valuable skills that we wouldn't want to lose. Whether that's within the responsibility or aegis of the Police Service of Scotland, I don't know, but I can certainly say that the head teacher of the high school in Edinburgh was delighted that this individual was coming back, but clearly I think it's food for thought for us as an administration, for the Justice Committee, and doubtless I'll pass on to the Chief Constable. Finally, Neil Finlay on this question. When the Cabinet Secretary last met with the Chief Constable, did he discuss miscarriages of justice experienced by minors who were arrested during the 1984-85 strike? Will the Cabinet Secretary meet with me and some of those convicted uh, and who, in their words, believe they were arrested on bogus, exaggerated or wholly false charges. Cabinet Secretary. I didn't discuss that precise matter, but I am aware of the issue that the member has correctly raised in terms of views here. We do have uh, legislation to deal with miscarriages of justice in Scotland. That's through the... Uh, uh, the uh, Criminal Case Review Commission, and clearly those who wish to uh, seek to overturn a conviction go through that route. Uh, what I can say is I think it's always been accepted that policing north and the south of the border has been distinct, and it would be fair to say that the Chief Constable was an officer south of the border probably at that time, uh, not one that now serves as Chief Constable north of the border, but he does recognise the difference in culture and practice. Many thanks. Question 7, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its legislation on air weapons will achieve a balance between protecting communities and allowing legitimate shooting in a safe environment. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we don't believe that it's appropriate to have unlicensed guns in Scotland. These are potentially lethal weapons. The regime set out in Part 1 of the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill aims to introduce a familiar, a familiar practicable and affordable licensing system which will allow a reasonable and fit person to continue to shoot. Licenses will not be provided to those who have no legitimate reason to have guns or seek to misuse them. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. I have written to the Cabinet Secretary on behalf of constituents who are concerned about the proposed legislation. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what his response is to claims that the Scottish Government has not listened to reasoned arguments against the proposals, the proposals are excessive knee-jerk reaction and will be costly to implement? Well, I will be writing to the member in full due course. What I can say is we have discussed significantly. There were meetings involving all those responsible gun clubs, those who represent the shooting and field sector, as well as police. So I think we have to get a reasonable, proportionate and balanced system. Uh, I have met uh, prior to the launch of the bill with the parents of young Andrew Morton. And it would be fair to say that Andrew Morton and Sharon McMillan were very supportive of action being taken because of the tragedy that befell their son 
son and that could and should not happen uh, to any other child. Equally, in next week, I'll be visiting the SSPCA because we are aware of the problems, issues and indeed tragedies that befell animals by those who misuse weapons. So the consultation was not about the principle of introducing licensing for air weapons. It's about the practicalities. We believe the case for licensing has been made. It was made with the tragedy of Andrew Morton. It's been made since, and it'll be repeated and directly recounted to me by the SSPCA. What we now have, I think, is detailed proposals, estimated costs, and we will work, as Jackson Carlaw raised, to ensure that those who have a legitimate reason to possess they fire our air weapon, whether because it's pest and vermin control or because they are a member of a responsible gun club, will be able to continue to do so. Thank you. Liam MacArthur, briefly, please. Uh, thank you very much. I listened with interest to the Cabinet Secretary's response to Jackson Carlow and to, to Bruce Cofford. to will be aware from the correspondence that we've had that are concerns in my constituency that this is a response to a problem in urban areas that's having a disproportionate impact on rural areas. What reassurance can he give me uh, and my constituents that the concerns of those living in rural and island areas will be taken fully on board as this legislation progresses? Well, I can give the same reassurance in terms of meeting with gun, uh, those who represent gun owners, those who represent Basque, uh, etc. I think I can give the member the assurance and I can predict that SSPCA will make it quite clear to me that this is not simply an urban area. Uh, this is a problem that transcends all of Scotland. Clearly, many in more rural areas have greater need to retain a air weapon because of their involvement in pest and vermin control, because they're farmers, and we have to take that account, and we will be. But the tragedies that have befallen Scotland, whether to individuals or indeed whether to animals, the misuse is not restricted to an urban area. It transcends all of Scotland. Thank you. Graham Pearson, briefly, please. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary knows that I support the intentions of the Bill. Nevertheless, there have been uh, reservations expressed about the ability of the authorities, particularly the police, to administer any new licensing arrangement, given the sheer volume of uh, air weapons out there. Has he costed the exercise and is he confident he can support it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have costed it because clearly that required to go in with the bill in terms of the financial documentation. Uh, we are aware of the concerns that the member has. It would be fair to say that we have met with the Chief Constable and indeed those who represent him at discussions with officials and they are happy that the police can cope and that is why we are working with them to ensure that the timescale is appropriate for them to be able to address matters. Thank you. Question 8, James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of the Scottish Police Federation and what was discussed. Upset. I meet regularly with representatives of the Scottish Police Federation to discuss a range of policing issues of concern to Federation members. Our next meeting will be on 25th June. Thanks, James Dornan. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. It is clear that the Scottish Government and the Scottish Police Federation have a close working relationship, which most importantly benefits the people of Scotland and has kept crime down to 30 nine-year law. Does the Minister therefore have any advice for his counterpart in Westminster, Theresa May, on how to properly engage in a useful and constructive relationship with her local police federation? Perhaps briefly, Minister, and then uh, we'll get in well, another I question. I respect very much the work that police officers do, and it's appropriate that I should engage and have a constructive working relationship with the Scottish Police Federation. I think I can give the member the reassurance it would be inappropriate for me to uh, refer to uh, Theresa May, but I can say we are not implementing Windsor in Scotland. And equally, I will reiterate, as I've already said to the General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation, we will not implement either Windsor nor me reforms in Scotland. Many thanks. Question 9, Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the UK Government's decision to introduce fees for employment tribunals of £250 to register a case and a further £950 before it gets a hearing and the particular effect that this has on women in equal pay in sexual discrimination cases. Minister Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, the Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism uh, did write to Joe Swinson MP on the 24th June 2013 before the introduction of the new legislation, making clear the Scottish Government's opposition to the new measures. Uh, this principled opposition will continue after a yes vote. I, I would be surprised, frankly, if any future Scottish Government uh, of any kind would think such fees are at all appropriate. Joan McAlpine. I thank the Minister uh, for that answer. With regard to equal pay cases, does the Minister share the widespread concern at the failure of North Lanarkshire Council to enter into talks and settling thousands of equal pay cases, despite admitting the mistakes were made? 
Minister. Uh, I need to be careful not to stray into uh, the portfolios of uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, I would remind the, the member that councils are, of course, independent corporate bodies and decisions on equal pay and on pay negotiations and legal costs are entirely matters for them. Uh, um, nevertheless, the Scottish Government is keen to see a resolution to all local authority equal pay claims and will continue to encourage COSLA and councils to resolve all such issues as quickly as possible. With the full powers of independence, we would, of course, have the power to enforce the Equal Pay Act. And, of course, fees for raising an action in a tribunal will adversely impact on precisely the kind of people so unfairly affected by the North Lanarkshire decision. Dr Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will remember I uh, tried to introduce an amendment at Stage 2 in the Tribunal's Bill to prevent the charging of fees. So, in the event which many of us would like to see of employment tribunals being devolved uh, to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, what mechanism would you propose using uh, to in ensure that these sorts of fees cannot be charged in Scotland? I would remind my, uh, uh, my colleague Elaine Murray of my answer at that time, which is the decision-making process about fees that might or might not be considered applicable are for the policy areas uh, in which that tribunal is located. And for example, the Lands Tribunal in Scotland has always had a feeing structure. Uh, so that the kind of proposal that Elaine Murray is suggesting would remove that from a tribunal where it has always uh, taken place. Uh, it isn't something that we envisage happening in the future, what the decision-making process around the formation of the Lands Tribunal was in regard to fees. I cannot comment on, uh, but uh, uh, as far as we are concerned, that's a matter for the individual policy area within which any tribunal emanates. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we now move to the next item of business, which is a European and External Relations Committee debate on its inquiry into.